Bonjour, je m'appelle Camille Delaune, je suis chargée des relations internationales à l'ENSIB et nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir Michael Buckland dans le cadre du programme Chercheur Invité. Hello Michael. Hello. A nice to meet you. It's my pleasure to be here. Can you present you? Well, I am a librarian and I have been a teacher of librarianship and researcher and writer, but now I am retired. <laughs> I began in England, I was English, my education was in England, and my parents wanted to know when I was a teenager what I would do for work. And I did not wish to discuss this, but they continued to ask. So I thought that if I give them an answer, they will stop asking. So the next time they asked, I said, well, I think libraries are socially beneficial institutions and probably it is good to be a librarian, so I will become a librarian until I find something more interesting to do. So I have been provisionally a librarian for more than 50 years. I finished my university studies in history and then I worked at the university library in Oxford, the Bodleian Library, as an apprentice. After that I went to the School of Librarianship in Sheffield. I was one of the first group of students at Sheffield in 1964. At that time, the British government was creating new universities and one of them was the University of Lancaster mm -hmm. in the northwest of England. And when you have a new university, you need a new university library. And I went to work in the new university library at Lancaster which was a wonderful experience because when, when you create a university library from nothing, it is very small. You have a very small number of staff and you must do everything. So in a short period, I had experience of nearly everything that one does in a university library. After that, the director of the library was a very enterprising man and he approached the British government and he said, look, you are creating new universities. You are creating new university libraries. It costs a lot of money. Now, a lot of people have done research on the history of libraries and we know how libraries are organized now, but you should be investigating the future of libraries. If you are spending so much money to create university libraries, you have a responsibility to think about what would be the ideal library in the future. And if you give money to us, we will make this research. This was entirely extraordinary for England in the 1960s. But paralyzed by the logic of the argument, the government agreed to fund a large research project. Unfortunately, they could not find anybody to do it. So they started with a much smaller project for one and a half people and I was one of the one and a half and I worked with a statistician. We had no idea what we should do, but a central concern of libraries is to make books available. So how often are they available? What is the probability that the next person who comes to the library will find the precise book they want. This has not been investigated. 
So we did a series of studies concerning the quality of service measured by how often can people find what they want. It was uh, an education for me because I had not done anything quantitative. We developed a model to simulate different policies on a computer. You see, whether or not a book is available at any point in time depends on how often people are asking for it. If it is borrowed, how long is it away? And how many copies? If nobody is interested in it, it is always there. If it is very popular and you only have one copy and keep people can borrow it for a semester, it's never there. So you have all these different possibilities. And that was very interesting work. And I was able to write a report on it which was sufficient for a doctoral dissertation. After that, by very improbable circumstances, mm -hmm. I was offered a position at a large library in the United States at Purdue University Libraries, which is in Indiana, about uh, 200 kilometers southeast of Chicago, mm -hmm. where I was responsible for the technical operations behind the scenes, the, the purchasing of books, the cataloging of books, uh, introducing the use of computers and so on. This was a very different experience from a little library in Lancaster or from the research. But the library had many problems, usually the result of inadequate management. And so I learned a lot about the people side of libraries and we did a big internal study looking at all of the um, difficulties, all of the problems and how should they be better organized, a more coherent, more effective, more efficient service. Uh, it was a good experience for me. The way we did it was we created a group, a team, from different people across the library of different sorts. And then this team would discuss, ask questions, discuss some more, and in the end made a hundred recommendations, all of which were implemented. So that, that was a, a big change for me, to go to America, to be in a large library, and to examine the qualitative people side of libraries. At the same time, in California, at the University of California, Berkeley campus, there was an important school of librarianship and they had interesting problems. Uh, there had been disagreement inside the school as to what its emphasis should be, what its priorities should be, how far should it concern itself with libraries, how far should it concern itself with uh, uh, newer areas of information science and so on. So the campus had created a, a committee to discuss what was the optimal role of a school of librarianship. And they decided that first preparing good librarians was a very good thing. But there were many other schools preparing 
librarians. So, although maybe Berkeley was doing it better, um, there were sufficient librarians being educated. At the same time, the problems of libraries involve selecting, organizing, arranging, and enabling people to find what they want. But outside of libraries, there are enormous problems in firms, in organizations, who have documents and data that need to be collected, arranged, organized, and found when you need to find them. So this suggested that although there were possibilities for good professional education and research inside libraries, there was an enormous need for librarian-like activities outside of libraries, in organizations, in institutions, and so on. And nobody, nobody was providing professional education for librarian-like activities outside of libraries. And there was a great need. So the Berkeley School of Librarianship should become a school of librarianship and library-like activities outside of libraries. We used the phrase, the marking and parking of documents and data for people to use in any context. That was a, a way of saying it, but that, that was the idea and everybody agreed this was a good idea in principle. But how do you do it? What do you do? Where do you do it? And at that time, the director of the school decided he did not want to be director anymore. He had done it for five years and five years was enough. So they needed a new director and they wanted somebody who had a doctorate. They wanted somebody who had worked in libraries and they wanted somebody from outside of Berkeley. And so I was invited to go and discuss this and in the end I accepted an invitation to be director of the School of Librarianship at Berkeley and we changed the name to School of Library and Information Studies, not science, studies, because then that can include archives and printing and, and so on. And so that was the challenge. I was expected to facilitate somehow a wider scope for the school. And we did that. Uh, after four years, I was very tired and I was allowed some months of sabbatical mm -hmm. research. And I went to Austria uh, and I was concerned with two problems. I was concerned that my colleagues, the professors, did not seem very interested in the other's work, only their own. And I thought that ideally everybody would be interested in how all the parts fit together on the relationships between the different elements. And they weren't very interested. The other aspect that concerned me was that we had made this big strategic change in the direction of the school and everybody agreed it was a good idea and we were making some practical changes. 
but we had not really discussed a sort of theory of what we were doing. It was a pragmatic move and we had not discussed the principles or a rationale for doing it and I thought there should be one. So during those months I tried, I decided first that these two different problems were really the same problem. It was a matter of looking at what is related to what else. And so I tried to write a theory, if you like. I started with libraries. I tried to establish how any aspect of library service is related to any other aspect and all of it is related to the context that the library serves. And this was done more or less in a book which I called Library Services in Theory and Context. But this was limited to libraries and it was a precursor to a more ambitious plan to look at the family of information services. I was thinking in biological terms. Think of comparative anatomy mm -hmm. where you have different mammals. They are similar, they're not the same, but you can compare and contrast. So I thought in terms of libraries being a species of a family, a genus, of information services based on collections. So you would have libraries, archives, databases of any kind, the management of documents in an organization, and so on. So you had these different species of the same family. And what was needed was a coherent view of the family. This had to wait a few years until I had another sabbatical. And the principal problem that I had is that I wanted to include museums. Specifically, I wanted to include museum collections. Not the catalogues in museums, but the objects in museums. And in the 1980s, the orthodox information science did not have the concepts or the terminology to consider museum objects as a kind of information. And the, I wanted to include museums and I did not know how. That was the, my principal difficulty. I went one day to visit a little museum. I like to visit little museums. In the meanwhile, I had become a bureaucrat for the coordination of libraries for all of the University of California that has nine campuses. Berkeley is well known, UCLA is well known, and there were seven others. In total, it's a big system. And there were a hundred libraries on nine campuses. And the Ministry of Finance of the State of California had demanded that they be a coherent economical system, not a hundred autonomous libraries that were separate. And there had been a director for planning for the whole system who had made a lot of progress in this, but then he stopped and they needed quickly somebody to be acting in that role and I agreed to do that. 
I learnt a lot about telecommunications and the staff developed an online, an advanced online catalogue for all of the documents in the hundred libraries as one online system. In the around 1980, this was very innovative. Anyway, I then had some time to go on sabbatical and I wanted to complete my grand theory and I had the problem of the museum objects. And I visited a little museum of vertebrate zoology, bones. And there were the furs, the pelts of animals, there were glass jars with nasty liquids and animals in them. But what captivated me was a cabinet with shallow drawers, you open them up, of the kind where you put maps, you know? Mm -hmm. But it was full of dead birds with a little ticket with a catalogue record on it. And I looked at these birds and uh, they were beautiful, but this seemed to me absurd because at Berkeley at that time there was an extreme shortage of space. Space was more difficult than money or people. So here in the middle of the campus you use your space for dead birds. It seemed absurd, not rational. But when I was young a wise old man had said to me, Michael, if you think that something is irrational, the explanation is probably that you do not know what the rationale is. So I thought to myself, well, if there is a rationale for this absurd use of space for dead birds, what could it be? Well, it is a university and we are concerned with learning both the students, teaching the students, and research by the professors. So I suppose these are a resource for learning and research. It's a good compromise between a photograph of a bird and a live bird, which is not convenient. Now, if these are resources for learning and for teaching, the librarian in me said, well, that is the same function as the books in the library. The dead birds here, it's a dead bird library. In effect, the dead birds are a kind of document. And this solved my problem for my book. So immediately I would talk to everybody in a great harangue, dead birds as documents. And then I went on my sabbatical. I went to Australia. I went to the University of New South Wales. And the first thing that I did is I went to see the director of the School of Librarianship at the University of New South Wales. And I immediately started explaining dead birds are documents. And he said, stop, stop. And he reached behind and he gave me a piece of paper. It was my idea written in French 40 years earlier, except it was not dead birds in a museum. It was a live antelope in a zoo mm -hmm. as a document. Again, my best ideas had already been discovered by somebody else. This French document was by a librarian called Suzanne Brier. She was one of the first librarians, female 
librarians at the Bibliothèque Nationale in 1928. And in 1951, she wrote a manifesto, Que ce que la documentation, with a number of interesting ideas. But people did not like these ideas and nobody read it and she was forgotten. But there in Australia, I was given her text and it was my idea. So two things resulted. I was able to complete a book of the whole genus family comparative anatomy of information services, which I called information and information systems. And I became interested in Brie. So I read more of her work and then I began to read other writings of documentalists in France and Germany that had been forgotten. Paul Otley is a little bit known, but there were others. And I felt like an archaeologist that has discovered a lost civilization. And I read more and more about this history. And in the end, I wrote a biography of a man who created the first electronic search engine in the 1920s before there were digital computers. His name was Emanuel Goldberg. He was a Russian. He was Jewish. He left Russia to avoid anti-Semitism and went to Germany in 1904. It was not the best place to avoid anti-Semitism. But he had a brilliant career, he made many inventions, and then he disappeared. He was kidnapped by Nazis, and in the end he went to Palestine. But he disappeared from the literature, and nobody spoke of him. He had become a forgotten person. And I spent many years to try to find the traces of Goldberg. So there were two results from the dead birds. One was to discover the history of documentation, which I continue, which continues to interest me. And the other was it enabled me to take a broader view of the field of information science and librarianship. After that, I stopped being a bureaucrat and I went back to my school as only a professor. And I did a number of studies, mostly about indexing and language, and also the problems of cultural heritage. Patrim one for a number of years and then one day when I woke up I calculated that I had been working for 40 years and suddenly that was enough and so I retired and as an emeritus professor I do what I want and I have been retired for 14 years and then I get an invitation to come to Lyon to visit Ancibe, so I am here. And what's your project for this uh, next year? Well, on Wednesday I will give a talk and there is more to be done on this theme, so I will continue to do that. Um, but I have another project. Some years ago, 
I interviewed an old man who was an American librarian. His name was Robert Gittler. And he established the first school of librarianship in a university in Japan. It was during the occupation by the Americans and allies after the Second World War. And he said that the true story of him and the library school he established had never been completely told. So I had a tape recorder and over a number of years I recorded what he could remember. He was old, he could not write anymore and he did everything from memory. But I edited it edited it into a kind of autobiography. Um, primarily his experience in Japan, which was extraordinary and very improbable. In 1951, 1950, he agreed to be director to establish a school in Japan. The origin was that in the occupation after the Second World War, the Americans wanted to change Japan. They did not want an imperial militaristic regime. They wanted a Western liberal democracy, preferably Christian, preferably with a Roman alphabet. They wanted to make it more like the United States. And so they changed the education system, they changed publishing, and they tried to develop libraries. The Japanese have a remarkable history of scholarship and of publishing and of books, but libraries not so much. And they uh, modernized, they help modernize the National Library. They created the National Diet Library, modeled on the Library of Congress from the old imperial collections. And they had a difficulty in finding enough librarians that were well qualified. And one day, a bureaucrat from the American Army visited Japan and he said to the Department of the Occupation Bureaucracy that was responsible for education and public information, he said, there is money that you have not spent and if it is not spent we will use it for something else. So one of the bureaucrats who had been a journalist and who liked libraries, he said, this is an opportunity. We must use this money to create a school to train librarians. So the occupation agreed that this was a good idea. And so you had this wonderful idea that the money of the United States Army should be given to the American Library Association to create a school of librarianship in Japan. Now they had done this before. The American Library Association had started a school of librarianship in Paris between the two world wars. The American Library School, which had a big influence for a number of years. But because there were difficulties in Korea, whoever was to go to direct it could not take any family, had to go alone. And not everybody wanted to go to Japan alone. But Robert Gittler said, Pourquoi pas? I will go. He arrived in Japan just before Christmas 
1950. And he had to choose a university, negotiate the creation of a school of librarianship, find professors, develop a curriculum, enroll students, and have all the equipment. And the academic year began in the middle of May. So he had about four months, and he succeeded one week late. It was quite extraordinary. After a while, the occupation ended, and money for the school disappeared, and the Rockefeller Foundation gave them enough money so that they could gradually stop being an American school and become a Japanese school. It was at Keio University in Tokyo and it was a great success and it is now one of the two big schools of librarianship today in Japan. So I did edited this autobiography of Robert Gittler. It is his story, it is his words, but I was curious it was not a probable adventure. Why was it successful when there were so many reasons that it would not be successful? So now he has died and I have been collecting material on the circumstances and the context of the founding of the school and it is a very remarkable story and I must write it up. It can be a book and I found that there was a very strong connection between American librarians who went to Japan and California and my school because the most important man other than Gittler was a man called Philip Keeney and he wanted to, he developed a plan for a unified plan for the development of libraries in Japan. And he was about to negotiate the implementation when he was arrested as a communist spy and sent back to the United States. And I do not know whether he was a spy or not. Probably not, but that is what people said. And his personal papers, copies of the memoranda that he wrote in Japan, were in the library of Berkeley, only a hundred meters from my office. So there is a rich area to do. Also, I want to do some work on family history. I have the family photographs from my parents, but often I do not know who the people are, and I am in effect the archivist for my family, and I must document it for my son and my grandson. Uh, that takes a lot of time. So there's all kinds of uh, interesting work to be done. Thank you so much, Michael.